Step 3. Electromagnetic waves in metals. We have concluded our discussion of uh, electromagnetic waves in the electric media. Now we want to know how the situation changes when we consider metals. So, one basic thing about metals is that there are no electric fields inside a metal. We can consider some electric field, particularly set up uh, between two um, capacitor plates. So one plate is charged positively, one, ch one is charged negatively, and this, this sets up nice uniform electric field. And if we put a metal box inside this field and ask what's the field inside, we will find by applying Maxwell's first equation that there is in fact no field. And this is direct consequence of the fact that metals have free charges. So the charges on the surface of this metal box will arrange themselves in such a way to cancel any field inside the metal box. How does this affect our situation of propagating electromagnetic radiation? Particularly, how does it affect the situation if we have air on one side and an electromagnetic wave traveling from air and trying to um, enter a metal? Well, before we saw that if this part here was a dielectric, then we've got a reflected component of our electromagnetic radiation and a transmitted component. But now, by using this fact that there are no electric fields in metals, we simply have no electric field on this side over here. So, something different must be happening at the boundary between the dielectric and the metal. This means that we have to derive new boundary conditions for this type of interaction. So, let's do that very quickly. The logic is exactly the same as we have seen in the case of the two dielectrics, but the consequences are, will be a little bit different. So, this is our scenario. We've got our dielectric here, represented by the shaded green, uh, blue area, uh, sorry, gray area, and this green shaded area is our metal. And again, our incident electric field has some vertical component and some horizontal component. And we leave this uh, index one to represent the fact that it's in, uh, in the upper half of our picture before it enters the metal or interacts with the metal. And we will start by considering the first two Maxwell equations. To remind you, they are given as this. The surface, the flux through a surface of an electric field is given by this expression here. So it's just the sum of all free charges divided by the permittivity of free space. And uh, the flux of a magnetic field through a surface is always zero. So we know that if we are talking about fluxes, we should draw a nice cylindrical surface area for this scenario. It will keep things simple, the calculations more manageable. And again, we can consider what's the flux through the top of the uh, cylinder uh, and the bottom of the cylinder and through the sides. Now we already said that there are no electric fields in the metal. Therefore, automatically the flux through the bottom uh, um, part of the cylinder will be zero. So when we write out um, the Maxwell's first equation, we get that EV1 is equal to 1 over epsilon naught uh, times the sigma. Now the sigma represents the charge density on the surface. Here we skipped a few steps. We should have written also the contribution from EH1 through the side of the cylinder, but we know the trick that we are, uh, need to apply. We have to shrink the cylinder such that the uh, height of the sides is zero, so it effectively just becomes a circular surface sitting on the boundary between the dielectric and the metal. And the area of that boundary is given by dA on both sides here, and this uh, 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 sigma is then just the charge density uh, inside this uh, surface dA. So we see that the vertical component of the electric field is given by the following expression. This is our new boundary conditions for metals. Now let's see what are the other boundary conditions. From Maxwell's second equation, we can see that BV1 times dA has to be zero because the flux through a surface is zero. And again, we are skipping few steps by shrinking the cylindrical surface. So automatically we get, because the area is finite, that B V1 is equal to zero. In other words, there is no vertical component for the magnetic field at the boundary. 
Now, considering the uh, remaining two Maxwell's equations, they deal with uh, uh, they deal with line integrals of the electric and the magnetic field. Therefore, we don't uh, we don't consider a cylinder anymore. We consider a simple loop, and this dA area over here on the right hand side corresponds to the area enclosed by this loop. So again, use, using Maxwell's third equation, we arrive at the following expression. EH1 times L, where L is the length of this top path over here, is given by the negative of d phi b over dt, where phi b is the magnetic flux through the area. Again, notice that there is no contribution from EH2, simply because there is no electric field in the, inside the metal. And we use the same trick again. We shrink the sides of our loop over here, these sides here, and what we get is that because we are shrinking the loop, we are, we are considering a vanishing area, therefore the flux through this area also has to vanish. In other words, the horizontal component of the electric field must be equal to zero. And from Maxwell's fourth equation, we get the following. We get that the pH1 times L, again, we only get the horizontal contribution from the magnetic field because it points in the same direction as the line segment that we are considering, must be equal to mu naught times I, the current, plus mu naught times epsilon naught times the change in the electric flux. And again, by shrinking the loop on the sides and turning it into a line, we make this flux through the area disappear because the area goes to zero. In other words, the horizontal component of the magnetic field is given by this. It's mu naught times JL, where this JL is really just um, the current per unit length. So we see that these four boundary conditions are very different in the case of metals um, when we compare them to the case of the dielectrics. In the next step, we will also consider what are the consequences. But in order to do that, let's consider what happens to an electric field, to an electromagnetic wave, as it is incident on a metal surface. So, this is our electric field, and we are considering a particular polarization. It's not really that important, it can be an un unpolarized light as well, but for our case, it will make the things a lot simpler. So what happens at the surface? Applying the boundary conditions, we see, one, that there is no E-field component in, uh, along the direction of the travel. And also, there is no E-field component along the surface at the boundary, meaning the electric field, as it hits the metal, must vanish. Also, any charges inside the metal are, are not aware of this electric field. The only charges of the metal that are interacting with the field are given on the surface. And in fact, what happens to the electric field is it bounces it off. It becomes reflected. Why is that? As the electric field is coming in and interacting with the surface charges, we know that such an electric changing electric field makes the charges oscillate. And they oscillate in such a way such that they produce a uh, an electric electromagnetic wave. And this electromagnetic wave is exactly bounced back as given by this dashed line. And we have seen such a scenario many times before. In fact, what happens? We produce a standing wave given by here because the pr uh, wave produced by the uh, electric charges inside uh, the surface of the metal is given by this where all we are doing is we are flipping the sign in front of omega t. In other words, we are making the wave propagate in the opposite direction. So proposing two such waves gives us a standing wave. We will see the importance of this fact in the next step when we consider propagation of electromagnetic waves in hollow metallic waveguides. See you there.